Hello, I'd like to introduce you to Graxia the Hallowed. This is my necromancer. Uh, he is quite a character and um, I'm going to zoom in straight away on uh, one particular part of his clothing. If you look at his goggles that he's wearing, this entire character, his backstory, everything about him came from those goggles because they appeared in the game and I wanted, as soon as I saw them, I wanted to create a character who would wear those goggles. So this entire character came from those glasses. While we're looking at his armor, uh, you can see there that uh, he's wearing dragon bone armor because one of the things that he does is uh, he likes to kill dragons and he's quite proud of his achievements. So every time he kills a dragon, basically he takes one of the bones as a souvenir and over time he's basically crafted himself this armor set. Um, and he's spray painted it gold because like I said, each piece is a, is a trophy. So he wears dragon bone armor and uh, yes, so he's got, oh, oh dear, uh, oh dear, <laughs> we've got uh, a dragon is about to attack the city. Uh, the, we we're just standing outside Stormhaven, which is uh, the city where his house is located, and this dragon is about to attack the city. Uh, okay, we won't get involved in that, uh, that particular fight, we'll let that one pass. Um, so yeah, we're stood next to this beautiful waterfall um, and my house is actually just inside the gates. But the reason why we are standing outside and not inside is because uh, as a necromancer, uh, necromancy is outlawed in the land of Tamriel. Um, so you can't actually practice necromancy anywhere. Um, it's a punishable um, by death offence. Uh, so I'm allowed to go into the city, uh, but I can't actually use any of my uh, necromancy abilities while I'm in there because if God catches me, he will kill me on sight. Um, I'm stood here with uh, what you can see here is uh, it looks like a beautiful black cat in um, a witch's hat, uh, but it's actually not a domestic cat. That is actually a very special race in the game called the Alfiq. And they are related to the Khajiit, uh, which is the, the cat people that you, you know, the, the character that I showed you last time, my main character, she's basically a, a cat. Uh, these little Alfiq um, are uh, descendants of uh, the Khajiit. But although they look like domestic cats uh, with clothing on, uh, they're actually very, very intelligent and exceptionally wise, and they are revered by all the Khajiit. And this is uh, Thea. She is um, a sorceress, uh, but she's taken a vow of silence. Um, so she doesn't speak and hasn't for quite some time. Um, and we will get to the reason for that later on. But she accompanies me everywhere. Uh, she was the best friend of uh, my wife, um, which again, is part of the story that will be revealed to you as we go on. Um, so that's Thea. She's a very powerful sorceress. Um, and in the game you actually encounter quite a few of these um, Alfiq in certain areas of the game and uh, they do speak um, as you can see in this example. This one may go to the palace to find ghosts. Rumor has it the last Khajiit royals of Senchal panicked during the Nahatan flu and locked themselves away inside. No one ever saw them alive again. Spooky. Yes. So, you have these very intelligent cats. Uh, yeah, Thea's a little bit tired. Uh, we've been doing a lot of adventuring lately. Um, and then we have this. Now, this is Bastian. Bastian is my, basically, is my apprentice. Um, he comes with me everywhere. So, we'll just say hello to Bastian. Can I help you with something? Um, he will pass comment on certain things as we go through uh, the game. He likes to. Um, say what he thinks as we're walking around so you may hear his voice again um, in some of the footage that we're going to see in a minute. So one of the things that I said at the beginning is that necromancy is outlawed and one of the things that I cannot do um, in the city is uh, cast any of the abilities. So one of the things I can do is I can raise the undead. So I can raise an undead mage to fight by my side and just as luck would have it we've got a Daedros that we can fight over here. He's quite a nasty boy. Um, I can throw skulls at him. He's just hit me for this great load of health, which is great. Um, 
uh, basically uh, I've got that as well, blast bones, so I can summon a skeleton, which you can see there, and he will basically run and throw himself, kamikaze style, into whatever we are fighting. <laughs> this is a really, really bad, uh, horrible boss, because he, he throws um, all sorts of stuff at you. <laughs> so all of these abilities, I'm getting away with casting them out here because there are no guards, uh, but if a guard was to catch me, then, um, like I said, I would be killed. So I can't demonstrate these particular abilities in my house or inside the city gates because um, it's not allowed. Um, now one of the things that this particular necromancer does, he used to be um, one of the high mages and he used to actually be the guild master of the mages guild here in the city of Stormhaven. Um, but for various reasons he turned to necromancy um, because of that he was basically cast out. So although he is a very very powerful and intelligent mage um, even to this day, um, he is now no longer a member of the Mages Guild. Uh, he was disgraced and he was told to leave. Uh, but his house is still in uh, the city from where he used to work. And one of the things that he loves to do, aside from necromancy, and um, for the ages. I don't know, Bastian just said something that I wasn't listening. Um, one of the things that he loves to do is he likes to uh, explore ancient parts of the world and find artifacts and then put them back together, which is what he did with this particular item. Let's ride. This is his mount. It's a basically it's a dwarven spider, and he has basically gone all the way around different parts of the world in order to find all the different parts and he's put it back together and as you can see there's steam and stuff coming out of the back of it so it's basically a mechanical spider and uh, this is one of the things that he has created so he's a little bit of sort of, um, an engineer a bit of a mad professor um, so he's very very intelligent a little bit eccentric um, so we are now coming into the city and this is the entrance to our house as you can see it's called the necromancer's nest that's what I've called it but before we go into the house I think it's important for you to see what kinds of things a necromancer actually gets up to in a day in Tamriel um, so I'm going to let you see some of the things that he has done today so enjoy that and I will be back with you afterwards
see that ceremony for the Dragon Guard? Very impressive. I'm just happy that the shields still have a job. Steady coin! Easy. If you have a steady sword arm, I have an endless supply of business propositions. Care to hear the details? Know anything about flowers? I should explain. A clan mother came to me with a heartwarming request. Apparently, Moonlit Cove holds some spiritual significance for the Khajiit. Doubly personal for her, since her grandmother often prayed there. The client used to plant lilies there in her grandmother's memory. Alas, she's getting on in age, and the prospect of sneaking around piles of bloodthirsty smugglers no longer appeals. So, I'd like you to take these lilies and plant them for her. So as you can see, a necromancer can do quite a bit in one day. Um, killing dragons, planting flowers, uh, digging up treasure chests. There's lots to be done in this game. And now, after a very long, hard day, uh, we are now back at home. So let's go inside the house. Okay, so here we are inside the necromancer's nest. And this is where I'm going to tell you a little bit more about who Grexia actually is. So, okay, where should we start? He's got quite an interesting history. So, um, I said earlier that he used to be the uh, leader of the Majors Guild uh, here in Stormhaven. And if you look just over here into the distance, up there, that's where the Majors Guild actually is. So you can see that his home was very, very close to where he used to work. But he no longer works there because he was cast out. And the reason for that is what we will come to now. So he's got quite a sad history um, and uh, it kind of explains how he came to be where he is today in his life. So years ago, um, there was a big problem with um, some dragons in another area of Tamriel. So if I open the map, uh, we can see here, this is where we are at the moment, in a place called Wayrest, which is in Stormhaven. Um, but if we look at the larger map, so this is the map of the world, this is where we are at the moment, which is in Stormha Stormhaven. And over here is where the dragons were released, in a place called Northern Elsewhere. And um, it became such a big problem that the people of elsewhere basically turned to the Majors Guild and said, can you please send all of your best mages to deal with this dragon threat? Because if these dragons get out of elsewhere and they're not contained, they will basically run rampage across the rest of Tamriel. So at the time, he was uh, the leader of the Majors Guild here, one of the most powerful mages in all of Tamriel, so he was sent to deal with the threat. Uh, and when he left, um, he lived here with uh, his wife. They'd been married for, for quite a few years. She was also a very powerful uh, sorceress herself. Uh, but she didn't accompany him because at the time um, that the threat occurred, she was very heavily pregnant, so she didn't want to leave. Um, so he um, left her behind, uh, safe here in the house, and decided that he would leave um, and go and tackle the threat. And he thought that, you know, they both thought that he would only be away for a few weeks um, at most. Uh, but unfortunately, he was away a lot longer than that. And it was nearly a year before he returned home. Um, and he was still fighting the dragons off in elsewhere when he got a message to say that his wife and uh, son, who had never yet met, uh, were both very, very ill and he needed to return home very, very quickly. 
Um, so he did, and he got home as fast as he could, but unfortunately it wasn't fast enough, and um, by the time he arrived, they had both already passed away. So he lost his wife and um, his only son, uh, who he never actually met. Uh, and he has never sort of forgiven himself for that, and he is racked with uh, guilt and grief for a very, very long time. And it turned him quite bitter in many ways. Um, and he, when he, after he found out that they had passed away, he decided to build this uh, memorial garden for them, uh, which is very beautiful. And as you can see, the sarcophagus and stuff uh, that has been made is uh, very pretty. It's got lots of engravings and stuff on it. Um, this is where but his wife and his son are both interred. You can see there on the front, on the top, are some of her favourite flowers. And uh, he's cast there that light that you can see shining above the, the sarcophagus there. It's the light of Meridia, which is basically a blessing. Uh, so it blesses both of their souls, um, keeps them free from any kind of interference or corruption, and it sort of basically protects them uh, while he's um, away from the house. And he's planted some of her favourite trees and things in the garden as well. Uh, so he's made it a sort of a very nice memorial place to come and remember them. But... Remembering them is not enough, and uh, what he decided to do not long after they passed away and he built this memorial was that he basically decided that he wasn't going to rest until he could find a way to bring them back. And in the world of magic, there is only one form of magic that is able to resurrect the dead, and that's necromancy. Um, and so it wasn't an art that he was remotely interested in beforehand, uh, but then decided that it was something that he should take an interest in. And so for the last few years, that's all he's been doing, is studying the art of necromancy and how it works. Uh, because in one day, he is hoping that he will uncover the way of actually being able to resurrect um, his wife and son, so he can one day see them again. But of course, the art of necromancy is outlawed in Tamriel, and so it wasn't long before the Mages Guild heard what he was doing, and uh, he was cast out and told that you know he could not be no longer be part of the order. Um, he wasn't exiled uh, because of the work that he had done uh, in order to push the dragons back. Um, they, in recognition of that, they didn't exile him from Stormhaven, and they let him keep his home, uh, but he no longer works in the Mages Guild. So we have that as sort of a backstory, and this is the house that he and his wife uh, lived in very, very happily for a long, long time. So let's go inside now and see what the necromancer's house actually looks like. So it's a very, very homely, uh, welcoming space, as you can see. Uh, lots of very nice furnishings, um, ornaments and things that both he and his wife have collected from their adventures together throughout the world. Uh, because they were always together, they worked together, and um, they did basically everything together. So her, not long, her no longer being around is a great loss to him, and he feels that pain every day. Um, and you can see that it's all set up very nicely, so there's lots of um, food and drink and things around the house. Uh, his wife was a fantastic cook, and uh, he loved uh, her cooking and her food. And if you look at him, <laughs> you can see that he has, he is a little bit portly, because uh, he does enjoy his food. Uh, and I made him that way on purpose, because he is kind of supposed to be middle-aged, so he's in sort of like, you know, mid-40s or something like that. So he's got a little bit of middle-aged spread, and he's at that point in his life where he just thinks, right, if I want to eat my food, I'm going to eat my food. Uh, but he really missed his wife's cooking, and so he employed this housekeeper, Keldora, to do all the cooking and stuff for him, because he's pretty hopeless. And uh, he knew that he would be able to do it himself. And also, he wants to spend his time doing as much studying and stuff as he can. So cleaning the house and cooking is not something that he wanted to do. So he pays Keldora to do that for him. So we have this very sort of nice homely space. There's a lovely music box over here that you can hear playing in the background. So let's take a look upstairs. So again, we've got some lovely furnishings up here. Uh, this uh, jewelry box here has actually got a dragon on the front of it, if you, if you look at it, an old dragon on the top. Uh, he was given that by Queen Chimera uh, in recognition of his efforts in saving the dragons. 
Uh, over here he's got, um, this is his enchanting table, so this is where he does um, everything with crystals and things like that in order to um, empower his armour and his weapons. And here is uh, their bedroom and that is a very important um, tapestry that you can see hanging over the bed. His wife actually made that, she's a fantastic seamstress as well as being a sorceress and she created that. Um, so that's why it hangs sort of pride of place above um, the bed. What is sad though is as we look around this room, this was her dressing table and he's basically left everything exactly as she left it. So you can see here we've got things like her jewellery box, there's her sewing kit, her comb, her mirror, everything basically is as she left it. Uh, there's the crib, um, there's the alchemy set that belongs to him so he sits in bed uh, reading about alchemy and science and anything that he can find to do with uh, that might link to necromancy he looks at as he's sleeping at night because it's the only thing that he can think about uh, there's some of her clothes and things like that so basically this area is very much how she left it and he's done deliberately very little to change it uh, because he is kind of you know consumed by her loss and uh, he's a bit lost really I guess which is why he's doing so much to try um, and bring them back whether he believes it or not in his heart I don't know uh, but it's something that occupies his mind and to him that is you know it drives him forward and keeps him going and so that's why he does it so the house so far looks like a very sort of normal standard kind of house but actually it isn't because if I turn around we see this. This is a Daedric portal and you can see here some creatures that he has conjured through necromancy uh, and they are now, they've been charged as kind of like guardians of the gates. So we've got a Vanakin, we've got a Stonefire Scamp and this is a Goliath. And uh, he stands here reading from ancient texts and conjures various things from the underworld that he uses as his experiments to do tests, to find out information, anything he can to further his study into necromancy and how it works. Um, over here we've got ancient maps, um, because he searches all over the world to try and find information that he can from ancient races and civilizations, anything that he can find that he thinks will help him in his search. And of course all of that requires a tremendous amount of reading and knowledge, so he's stored up a huge library, floor to ceiling books. Um, he's got an alchemy station here where he does all of his science experiments. And of course no mage is complete unless you, you know, you don't have time to sit down and put things in a book, so you write a note on a piece of paper and then you conjure it into a maelstrom like this. So all of his notes are kind of like flying around the room, so it's kind of a reflection of the madness and chaos inside of his own mind, I guess, uh, that it's all kind of just flying around in midair, um, not really sort of pinned down to anything. You've got some enchanted books here as well, so you can see those are sort of floating next to what is his desk, his writing desk. This was his wife's desk, because they used to work uh, side by side, obviously no more, uh, but again, that is exactly as she left it, and that's her feather quill that she's just sort of left um, on the side, and he, again, he's not touched that since she did. Um, over here we've got a workbench because just like he built his mount, um, when he's travelling around he finds ancient parts of dwarven artefacts and then he, when he gets enough of the parts he can fix them together and he's made there a dwarven spider, um, and which are now extinct, they don't exist anymore so that's probably the last one uh, that's actually working left in the world and he created it. Um, we do have here a cauldron of distilled coagulant. Um, or blood, to put it in another way. So he's not beyond uh, looking into the dark arts in order to find the answers that he seeks. And that includes speaking to races that are also outlawed. Necromancy is outlawed, but so is vampirism and werewolves. Uh, and so he's been talking to the vampires because he's very interested in how they live so long as they do. And of course, a lot of that is to do with blood magic. So there's a vampiric influence as well here. Um, so it's starting to take a much darker turn. So if we go downstairs again, this house looks very homely, it looks very cosy, but is it? Because there's a basement, and basements are dark and scary places. 
And this one's no different. And there's a red portal across the door, which, you know, is never a good sign. But anyway, we're going to go down here and see what's here. And this is where it starts to turn very, very dark indeed. So we have this fan on the floor, uh, but it's, it looks like a fan, but actually it isn't. What it's, it's sucking up, as you can see, this black smoke. And that black spoke is actually uh, underworld spiritual energy. So dark, evil spirits are coming up through here. And this is where he does some summoning and rituals and things like that when he needs to uh, get information uh, and experiment. Uh, over here, we've got two cages uh, because he is not beyond putting people in prisons and cages uh, in order to get the information that he needs. If it's not given to him willingly, then he will stop at nothing to get that information. This was one such victim, so this particular person was a vampire. He refused to tell him what he wanted to know, so Graxia basically made him soul-shriven, uh, and that means that he turned him to stone and sucked out his soul, which is what you can see just behind him there. Grax's plan is to work out how he can get the information by interrogating his soul rather than the person. He hasn't worked it out yet, um, so it's still there, but that's his intention. Um, here we've got a baby imp, uh, a baby dragon, sorry, a baby dragon imp. Um, this was orphaned. Uh, Draxia found it and he's basically kept it. Uh, because he's interested to know how the dragons get their power, how they develop, how they grow. So in order to learn more about the dragons and how to fight them, he's actually got a baby one in here, so he does experiments. Uh, and he's watching this one grow to see if he can learn anything. But we also have some very dark things in here. So we have cages to keep people in. We've got uh, torture racks that you can see there's some old victims on there. We've got this torture rack with this victim who uh, well, clearly didn't make it. Um, and then over here we've got this blood fountain which is something that he's fa he borrowed from the, the vampires. This is something that they use. Um, they worship this. Um, it's, they pour blood into it and do all sorts of rituals and stuff and it helps them to live longer. So that's something that he's kind of experimenting with and sort of looking into himself and hoping that he'll find the answers that he seeks. Uh, we've got an Iron Maiden here, which you can see is covered in cobwebs. He hasn't used this one for a while, but this one he has. So let's open it. Oh no, look. There he is. There's a poor victim in there uh, that did not survive that encounter. Now, all of this is very, very dark. And if you look on the, the floor, there's nothing there. But if I walk over to it, as you can see, it started to glow. This is a magic trap. So if somebody comes down here unwittingly, they stand on this part of the floor and they will be rooted to the spot. Uh, they won't be able to move. Um, so it's basically um, a security measure in case, um, you know, when he's away, uh, somebody was to come down here. But also, obviously, if he wants to catch somebody, you can't see it until you actually walk over it. And of course, he's immune to it because he cast it there. So yeah, and we've got magic traps on the floor. And then over here, we've got cages of experiments that kind of went wrong. Uh, so we've got a death hound over there. This was a jaguar, and uh, as you can see, it's kind of on fire. So yeah, these are experiments that didn't go to plan, so he's put, he basically put them into cages down here. So, all quite dark stuff. I'm going to go back upstairs. I'll close that. So we keep this closed because obviously necromancy and everything that he's doing is illegal. So he has to keep it a secret as far as possible. So the house at face value looks normal until you sort of go upstairs and turn the corner or you go downstairs into the basement. So let's go back outside. So we've already seen this memorial, again, looks um, very respectable uh, from the outside, so anybody coming in wouldn't think that this is you know, unusual or odd in any way. But the garden continues. Now when I made this house, I actually challenged one of my friends. I said, there is a secret passage in this garden, can you find it? Um, they ran around for ages trying to look for it. Now can you spot it? It is right there. Judah, can you see it? Because they couldn't see it. It's just here. And if we go behind the secret garden wall, uh, we again see some very dark things. So we've got a torture wheel that is continuously turning here. We've got sigils and stuff that he's painted dark. Forbidden magic that he's using basically to again get information um, from witches or anybody that he can in order to get, you know, 
to find the answers that he seeks. And then there's this grave. Now, if you watch this grave, oh look, necromancy at work. There's an arm coming out of the grave, outstretched. <laughs> I kind of like that. I love that uh, animation. I think it's really cool. Uh, I don't know who this grave is. We don't ask questions, uh, but obviously there is somebody in there who is still trying to get out. Um, and over here we've got a sacrificial table, so there's a witch there that, you know, didn't survive the last interrogation that he did. Uh, and there's bloody soaked rags and stuff on the floor. So, you know, he doesn't enjoy doing any of these things. And like I said, necromancy is not something that he would have ever considered before. Um, but it's something that he sees now as a means to an end. Um, because... You know, he would really basically really love to be able to see his wife and son and speak to them again. And he'll stop at nothing in order to try to do that. So, yeah, it's a very sad tale. Um, but, you know, a lot of stories tend to be that way. And this is his story. So this is Graxia's story. That's his life to date. And, um, yeah... He will keep fighting uh, dragons, he will keep searching, and uh, hopefully one day he will find the answers that he seeks, although it's probably unlikely, because if it was possible, somebody would have done it already, and um, they haven't, so he won't stop trying though, and he's a very clever mage, so you never know, he could be the one that finally finds the answers to life after death, um, but it's unlikely. So, I hope you enjoyed that. This is Graxia. This is his house and that was his life. So, thank you for watching.